Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to do three athletes, all of whom I saw play, and then two entertainers. We're going to lead off with two baseball players who were both legends of a sort in Boston for the Red Sox. The first is Frank Malzone, who died recently at the age of 85. Frank Malzone was a nice Italian boy born in the Bronx who gravitated to the Red Sox after being in the service, and he played third base for the Red Sox for 11 years, finished off his career in California. But it was in Boston they made his name in the late 1950s and early 1960s as the bridge between the Ted Williams years and the Carl Yastrzemski years. He was probably the best fielding third baseman in the American League in the years before Brooks Robinson was established. And while he didn't play long enough and wasn't a good enough hitter to make it to the Baseball Hall of Fame, he was an All-Star six times and he made it into the Red Sox Hall of Fame. He was actually active in the Red Sox organization for 50 years after he retired from baseball. Here he is scoring the winning run in the 1958 All-Star Game. It's the 25th All-Star Game, Baltimore's first at over 48,000 Jam Memorial Stadium. Rival managers Fred Haney and Casey Stengel swap pleasantries before the game, which sees lackluster hitting and goes into the sixth free all. Pinch hitter Ted Williams at bat. No one has hit anything but singles so far. And Williams hits a roller to short. Thomas fumbles, and Malzahn is safe on second. Gil McDougall is next. A blooper single to center, bringing Malzahn home. It turns out to be the winning run and the last hit of the game, which saw only nine hits from the Americans and four from the Nationals. Well, as I said, in the late 50s and early 60s, when the Red Sox really didn't have very good teams, Williams was retiring, Yastrzemski was breaking in, Frank Malzahn, was the one constant on the field. We're going to move on now to another Boston Red Sox sort of legend, Dave Henderson, who died recently at the age of 57. Dave Henderson was an outfielder who actually played for a number of teams, but it's with the Red Sox that his name is most associated because he hit one of the most important playoff home runs for the Red Sox in 1986. In fact, if the Bill Buckner game in the World Series had gone the other way, They'd probably be erecting a statue of Henderson in Boston because it was his home run that put them in the World Series. They were playing the California Angels in the American League Championship. The California Angels had never been to the World Series. The Angels were had three games to one and were up five to four in the ninth inning of the fifth game in California, needing only one more strike to win the game. Henderson was facing the Angels ace relief pitcher Donnie Moore who threw an off-speed split-finger pitch, and here's what happened. Game 5 of the 1986 American League Championship Series. The California Angels take the lead in the sixth with some help from one that just got away from Dave Henderson. A Don Baylor home run pulls the Sox within one of the ninth. When Henderson returns to the spotlight, with the Angels one out away from going to the World Series. Donnie Moore is on the mound for California. Rich Gedman is the runner on first for the Red Sox. So loud, I remember that. My ears were really, really hurt. The game filled with just so much emotion because at one point we were losing the ball game and you're thinking, well, the season's over. Still 2-2. Two two. see all the police game in front of you, all the guards, and we're, we're trying to look in between their legs and watch David hit. I was... Right down by the dugout because we were going to go on live outside the locker room immediately after. The Sox were going to be eliminated. It was going to be a pretty ugly scene for myself to have to interview the Red Sox players just getting eliminated by the California Angels. To left field and deep and down he goes back and it's gone! Unbelievable! It's pumping again, you're drilling, I'm hugging all can. I'm telling you, you know... Once we get back home, let's get through game six. You get game six, get game six, and, and get me game seven, and we'll get it done. All these policemen and guards start filing out of the dugout. We took our positions back on the seat. The, the crowd quiet down, and you can hear a pin drop in that stadium. With one swing of the bat, the fortunes of the team, New England, and myself changed. My ball went over the fence. That made the series 3-2 to two in favor of the Angels. They came back here, and they were like mince meat. They, they couldn't perform. I heard half of them weren't packed. They, they just planned on winning that game. And well, the Angels lost. The Red Sox went to the World Series. They, too, were one strike away from winning the World Series in 1986 when you had the complete collapse featuring the Buckner error. An interesting and tragic side note to that is that Donnie Moore, the Angels relief pitcher who broke in with the Cubs, by the way, committed suicide a couple of years later. People always attributed it to that pitch 
And actually, it wasn't really because of that. He'd had other personal problems as well, although his career was never the same after that pitch. By the way, they asked Dave Henderson, who was a modest man, what his biggest thrill in sports was. you got to figure he'd say that home run. And he said it was scoring four touchdowns in a high school football game. We're going to move on now to a guy I saw play many times at Wrigley Field with the Chicago Bears, Doug Atkins, who died recently at the age of 85. And even today, he's recognized as one of the greatest defensive ends in football history. He was a huge guy, 6'8", and he was one of the stalwarts of the 1963 championship team that had almost as good a defense as the Bears' 1985 team. He was also well known for his fights with the team coach and owner, the irascible George Hales. Here's Jack Brickhouse, who used to call those games, interviewing Doug Atkins. The last Chicago championship football team, the 63 Bears. The star defensive end of that team was a 6-foot-8-inch, 265-pound, not-so-gentle giant named Doug Atkins. George Hallis called him one of the greatest players of all time. An eight-time All-Pro, he played in four championship games, and if you saw him play, you'd probably agree that today's bruising linemen are following his big footsteps. He was the feared number 81 in the Monsters of the Midway. He earned the first Vince Lombardi Award, and the Southeastern Conference honored Doug as its player of the quarter century. I was number one draft choice, Cleveland Browns, in uh, 53. Well, my bonus was two cheeseburgers and eight beers. We'd you back sign me down in Moultrie, Georgia. I was playing basketball with the Detroit Vagabonds, and I thought that's all the money in the world. Doug played 17 seasons in the NFL, but his best memories were of one team, the 63 Bears. I'd say it was the best group of people I'd ever played with. We had lots of talent. You had lots of good people, and, and we didn't have too many cliques. Everybody was just one big happy family, I think. That's one reason we did as well as we did it. at Cleveland. We had this clique. We had this. had about three or four different cliques, a group here, a group here. But when I went to Chicago, I noticed that everybody was just kind of all together and went together. It was more of a little family deal there. I don't know where her house was responsible for it or what, but. That's some pretty good football players. As fierce as he was on game days, Doug had a reputation for loafing during practice. I loved to practice during the season because it was short, it was quick, and you like to do a, get a little sweat up. When you go out and have your beer, too, that tastes a little better. Papa Bear didn't appreciate some of Doug's off-field habits. The coach hired detectives to check up on the players. And he said, did you say that? I said, well, I'm not really not exactly like that, and this, that, and other. He went on, oh, and I said, there's no use in lying this old man. He knows exactly what I said. So after the season, when I checked up, he says, Doug, I want to thank you for making me do this. I said, what do you mean? He says, making me get people to follow you around. He says, you'll be surprised at the things I found out about what's going on. He says, this is going to make us a better team next year. I want to thank you again. See, he just turns the thing right around on you. I mean... You know, you go in there mad, and the old man's thanking you for helping him, for having people follow you. Of course, I didn't buy all that stuff, but I, he was really something else. What I think he'd been doing all these years, he'd been finding people, and that was tax-free money for weigh-ins and all that stuff. Like Rick Osiris always got five, two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 a year. Hey, that was money right in his pocket. We paid taxes on it, and he kept it. Now, I'm sure he helped a lot of people and gave a lot of stuff to charity, but when he finds you, you paid the tax on your W-2 form, so he didn't miss a trick. Hollis and I had our differences, but, you know, I told him what I thought when I played with him while I was under him, and then I couldn't get nobody to support me then on the team. Very few people would even support me. They just let me go and say, keep your mouth shut. I said, well, it's not right. I'm just saying what I think. Well, after I said what I wanted to say and I retired, I didn't have anything else to say. And people tried to, won't you do this? The Hollis, I said, hey, I told him what I wanted to tell him while I was there, so... I noticed a lot of the people, after they got away from him, they started to kind of a knock at him and saying things that I thought they should have said while they were playing. Something that really gets me about football, it's not that you want any of the glory or anything, but you know the kids talking about, have you ever played in a Super Bowl? I said, no, I never played in a Super Bowl. I played in a championship. Oh, you didn't play in a Super Bowl. See what's happened. I don't know where it's a press or what. They have forgotten back the championship games, which were... Much tougher than the Super Bowl. I hate to take any of the glory away. That's when you had 12 teams, 32 players, and the two top teams played. And then they, there weren't no specialties made the teams back in those days. Well, they've completely mopped part of the football out. We're going to move on now to Wayne Rogers, who died recently at the age of 82. He's an Alabama boy who went to Princeton and then got into acting. And he played Trapper John, the role that Elliot Gould played in the movie in the television version of M.A.S.H. Got to play our obligatory M.A.S.H. theme song. <laughs> Left 
the series after three years probably wasn't the best career move considering the residuals he could have gotten because he thought they were writing all the good parts for Alan Alda, who was Hawkeye, and that's probably true. But he and Alan Alda remained friends, and here Alan Alda talks about it. Wayne and I were very close. We got close, we still are close, and decided to get close. It was very interesting. We are both very serious about trying to do the best work we could. We went out to dinner before, while we were still in rehearsal, and we, we both said that we wanted to make this as good as we could. And we got to know each other to help that process. I think we both knew we'd do better if we were really friends, became good friends. And we, we would rehearse as much as we could. In fact, we, we both chuckle still about this day. We were rehearsing a scene after we had shot it and after the day's work was over. We stood by the trailer. We were, we were standing in front of the trailer as though the trailer were the camera. And we were playing to the side of the trailer to see if we could get the scene to work because we didn't think it had quite worked on camera. Now, we were never going to shoot it again. We didn't think that if we got that scene, we could go back and fix it. We just wanted to see if we could do it well, which really did help other scenes, of course, because there were many, you know, hundreds more scenes that we would act again. Having tackled that until we thought we got it, gave us the chance to approach other scenes. Little Wayne Rogers trivia, his roommate in New York in the 50s was Peter Falk. He didn't have much of a movie career, but he was in one movie I liked, and he had a pretty good role in it. He was Gambler in Cool Hand Luke. Here's a famous scene, and he's got a famous line. That's him saying, hey, Baba Lugatz, we got a bet here. Baba Lugatz, by the way, was Dennis Hopper. I can eat 50 eggs. Nobody can eat 50 eggs. You just said he could eat anything. You have to eat 50 eggs. Nobody ever eats 50 eggs. Hey, Baba Luga, we got a bet here. My boy says he can eat 50 eggs, he can eat 50 eggs. Yeah, man, how long? The hour. Well, I believe I'll take part of that wager. No. Two dollars, right here, I'm with the cook. Oh, come on now, let's talk some money. All oh, right, $20. And the syndicate will cover any kind of bet you want to make. Go, go get some paper. Drag. Right. 50 eggs got to weigh a good six pounds. Man's gut can't hold that. They'll swell up and bust them open. They're going to kill him. All right, get your money up. Now, gamble a dynamite. Come on, get it up. Coconut head's going to take all the money. Come on, loudmouth, get it up. Oh, wait just a minute. How's he going to eat? The for 15 minutes, eat the whole thing in an hour. Wayne Rogers shifted from show business to financial planning. He was a brilliant financial planner. He was a consultant for Fox News. I gotta play this one little clip of him. Well, it's not negotiating, but you're a moron yes, because you talk too much and you don't think through it. I'm gonna close tonight with Natalie Cole, who died recently at the age of 65, daughter of Nat Cole, and she was a Grammy Award winner in her own right. She had a troubled life, and I don't want to concentrate too much on it, but here was her biggest hit. This will be an everlasting love. This will be the one I've waited for This will be the first time anyone has loved me oh, oh, oh. I'm so glad you found me in time And I'm so glad that you rectified my mind This will be an everlasting love for me in my opinion, the best stuff Natalie Cole did was a synchronized duet she did with her father, who died in 1965. This is the knee plus ultra of synchronized performances between live and dead performers. When I fall in love, it will be forever, or I'll never fall in love. In a restless world. Like this is, love is ended before it's begun. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. As I said, this was the height of synchronized music. In my opinion, the greatest synchronized performance ever recorded was the beautiful voice of Nat King Cole and the beautiful voice of his daughter doing Unforgettable. <laughs> Unforgettable That's what you are Unforgettable Though near or far